Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Early signing day took place yesterday. So, you know, I had to bring on John Garcia, Jr., director of football recruiting, to talk about everything we saw on a crazy day across the country. And, John, first I'm going to ask you because we heard the hype. It was built up like never before. This offseason was going to be crazy. And we saw some craziness on early signing day. So I'm going to ask you, somebody who eat eats, sleeps, and, and breathes recruiting, their early signing day fail to meet expectations? Did it meet expectations or did it exceed expectations yesterday based on what you thought would happen? I mean, in, from a working perspective, it exceeded expectations. We were a lot busier than I thought we would be. There was, there's always going to be drama. You, you know that, but you know, the, the Peyton Bowen fiasco, not signing the letter of intent, uh, that was was a, a bit of a curveball. Ditto for Cormani McLean. So maybe the top safety and the top corner in the country. A lot of drama with those guys. Um, there were big flips early in offense, so we had to pivot pretty quickly. Uh, thanks to Oregon, uh, kind of stealing everybody's thunder. So yeah, it, it, it lived up to expectations. You know, the, these these new coaching staffs hit the ground running. Auburn in particular, I thought uh, Dion in Colorado made some some moves as well. So. It was busy. It was a little bit of everything, so much so that these great classes at the top of the rankings, Alabama, Texas, Georgia, almost didn't get talked about as much because we knew they would be great and they confirmed it. But all the surprises thereafter kind of took away, in my opinion, from from their shine just just a little bit. Yeah, you spoke of uh, Peyton Bowen. I just saw like 10 minutes ago uh, somebody from Rivals put in a future cast for Oklahoma. So, yeah, I, I don't even that I, thing I is think, wild. That thing yeah, is I wild. think I think we're far from done with that saga. And I wouldn't be surprised at this point if he ends up at Oregon, Notre Dame or Oklahoma. So um, I guess that's a, 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 a wave that we'll be focusing on here in the near future. And then you mentioned Carmani McLean. Everybody expected him to sign with Miami. And then next thing you know, he's getting future cast put in for Colorado with Dion, right? So yeah. I, I guess we'll just have to figure this out. This is Locked on Longhorns, though. So we're here to talk about the Texas recruiting class. And we know that they're not necessarily done with the recruiting class, but everybody that has committed thus far signed on the dotted line. So how would you evaluate this 2023 class for Texas now from top to bottom since everybody that's committed to the Longhorns has signed with the Longhorns and Steve Sarkeesian? Look, this is an elite class. I mean, there, there's really no other way to look at it. You, and you hit a lot of marks at the end of the cycle, right? When you have a great group, what questions pop up? Okay, are they all going to sign? And who's going to withstand the poachers, right? Every The flip game is, is such a big part of December. Who, who can withstand it? Ryan Niblett, Jonte Cook, Malik Muhammad, Cedric Baxter, um, uh, Sadir Mitchell, there was some buzz late. Derek, Derek Williams with my others. Derek Williams, uh, not only buzz about other schools, but maybe waiting till February. Texas and that group combated all of that. And, and they all signed, as you mentioned. So I think that alone says a lot. And then you went out and pulled another upset, right? Uh, Tausili Akana out of Utah. Texas was kind of hanging around in this recruitment and then at the very end, here we go. Texas upsets Oklahoma for a pass rusher, uh, just like we saw with Colton Vasek and some others. So you're also checking boxes against your primary recruiting rival in out recruiting them overall and at the very end for a, a common target. Um, and then when you zoom out even further, I, I love the balance of this class. You sign the five offensive linemen after signing the best O-line class in the country last year that is very very hard to do uh you you completed the flip of anthony hill there was no drama there uh that one could have gone a little bit sideways just based on how quiet it was i think hill took one visit after the decommitment and that was it and, and i know droves of schools were trying to get him on campus late in the game there was some miami buzz at the 11th hour there um so you hit on big defensive targets there's balance I uh, love the trench class, particularly on the offensive side. You did hit some pass rusher marks on the defensive side. Um, and, you know, I've been a big fan of, of this secondary for quite some time. I, I really like Malik Muhammad. I think he's one of the best corners in the country. Derek Williams, drama aside, elite, elite safety. He's ready to play sooner rather than later. And then, obviously, offensive skill. I don't have to dig into 
Arch and Baxter and Cook and Niblet and these receivers. You know, I don't have to dig into those guys. And then we'll, we'll still see about DeAndre Moore, right? So, so that could be kind of the final skill position piece offensively uh, to really round out that that receiver core because you've got Cook can do everything. Uh, Niblet is your slot gadget type guy, and then Moore to me is your balanced, steady receiver who could work on the other side. He's he's your your guy in the margins who can make plays for you. So I, I would really like how that would round out the class. But look, this is a great, great, great class that Texas is bringing in. I think a lot of these guys are going to play very early on the 40 acres. Um, Arch Manning aside, I, I think it's going to be an instant impact group. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's about as good as I think Texas fans could have hoped for. And, and I think it shows, it shows a lot of metal. Um, not not the substance, but metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, shows a lot of grit uh, from this coaching staff because when you bulk up in the summer and you, you go on a run like Texas did, it's easy to lose some of that, A, momentum, or B, targets. It's easy to lose some of those guys later in, in the cycle. We, we saw it happen at AM. We saw it happen at Michigan State. We, we've seen it happen at Notre Dame. We've seen it happen at a lot of these places that went on these summer runs. It didn't really happen at Texas. I don't know the final decommitment numbers. Yeah, we had three. Itself, so it's, it's Jamel Johnson, uh, Dylan Spencer, and Jonah Wilson decommitted. But you talked about Notre Dame. We didn't lose a Peyton Bowen. We didn't lose an Anthony Hill, right? Correct. We picked up Anthony Hill. Right, right exactly. <laughs> exactly. You upgraded as, as the cycle went on, even as the on-field product was a bit more up and down than maybe some folks expected, which is another good sign relative to some other schools because you know the on-field product at AM, at Michigan State, uh, even at Notre Dame, you know it affected those off-season runs that those those programs went on. So Texas also withstood that collectively. I'm going to uh, – you talked about – you kind of previewed this a little bit with Cecilia Arcana. Uh, you're getting in your podcast host bag, giving a nice little tease there. <laughs> but uh, – Texas was able to pick up Cecilia Arcana, right? Uh, they stole him yesterday from, from Oklahoma, and there was some Colorado buzz uh, as well with him being a Utah kid. I'm not sure if Utah was in on it. Steve Wiltfong from 24-7 said that Texas is starting to recruit the front seven at a championship level. When you look at this class alone, you have a Darion Gallette, you have Colton Vasek, Cecilia Arcana, Anthony Hill, Leona LaFowle, Samaj Burrell, right? Do you agree that Texas heading into the SEC – is starting to recruit the front seven at a championship level. Well, well, you've got to. I, I think, I think from the linebacker perspective and the edge perspective. I forgot Sadir Mitchell. I'm so sorry. I forgot the big man, Sadir Mitchell, too. There you right. Go. See, that's where I'm going with it. I, I think from from a volume perspective, you've hit it on the edge. You've hit it at linebacker, off ball as well. Uh, obviously, Anthony Hill will stabilize the second level. But I, I think there's a little bit more to be desired up front on the interior. Mitchell was a great get. You, you, you need more uh, of, of those interior defensive line types in that regard. So a little bit more beef, I think, would, would still probably be required going forward. But here's the thing. You don't have to pull all of that from the high school ranks. You know, Mitchell is obviously that guy in, in this class, but – you can pull some of that in the portal. Uh, and, and you've obviously got other guys on the roster who could maybe develop and have an opportunity to move up in that regard themselves. So that's really the only, if you want to nitpick the front seven, it's that, that position in particular. But again, it's, you know, it's December. There's still going to be some guys that slip through the cracks. There's still going to be some action with prospects like that. So outside of DeAndre Moore on offense, I would look to see if, they address some interior defensive line possibilities here uh, between now and, and spring football. But otherwise, yeah, I, I love the linebackers. You've got that combination of of pure uh, athleticism with your galettes of the world. You've got the edge guys. Uh, we, we've talked about them at length. Then you got your steadying force there in Anthony Hill who can come downhill, play the run, and work inside out. You got a lot of inside out and outside in in, in this group this year and last year. So – yeah, you've checked just about every other box in that regard. Just want to see a little bit more beef on the defensive interior, although you could probably ask one of those offensive linemen to slide over a uh, worst-case scenario. 
Yeah, the beef is going to be really important headed to the SEC in a few years. Quick word from Bet Online, and then we're going to talk about DeAndre Moore and then a transfer corner that the Texas Longhorns picked up yesterday on early signing day as well. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and World Cup. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. So, John, recruiting is so crazy, right, that DeAndre Moore is committed to Louisville, yet there probably were more Longhorn fans watching St. Bosco <laughs> signing day presentation than Louisville fans were because most Longhorn fans felt like it was a foregone conclusion that DeAndre Moore would eventually flip to the University of Texas, and most of them felt that he would sign with Texas on early signing day at you know St. John Bosco's high school presentation. That did not happen. He did not sign at all. Do you think that's a good sign or a bad sign for the University of Texas moving forward, knowing that Louisville and Georgia are still very much at play in his recruitment? Look, when when you don't sign with the school you're committed to and it, it gets delayed or pushed or what have you, it's always good news, in my opinion, for everyone else. So just like you said about Peyton Bowen, OK, he, gets, he commits to Oregon and then he doesn't sign. And now days it, it's been 24 hours. Probably good news for Oklahoma, or maybe even Notre Dame at this stage, right? So ditto for DeAndre Moore. Uh, committed to Louisville, coaching change. Um, and and St. John Bosco played really late into December, right? They won the national title at the high school level. So they're playing later than most everyone else. So while the coaching change goes down, you have less time, less visits to really go figure out, hey, is this where I want to go with this new coaching staff, not the one – that I committed to, even though the reputation is positive and offensive with, with Brom, you still have to go build those relationships. So you understand why a California kid of all is going to be a little bit more hesitant. Ditto. He took a bunch of visits late in the game, Texas and Georgia, most notably. Uh, so yeah, I think him not signing with Louisville is a good sign for Texas and Georgia collectively, but I think there's been more buzz uh, with Texas uh, really down the home stretch. I'd say since Thanksgiving, we felt like DeAndre Moore is more likely to, to flip to Texas than to Georgia. So I haven't heard anything tangible to make me come off of, of that notion. And him not signing, t to me, furthers uh, the opportunity Texas has uh, either Thursday or Friday uh, to wrap up uh, what is a very interesting recruitment among the many that are still going on. I'm glad you said that because Texas fans took it as the complete opposite. Hell, I took it as the complete opposite. I'm like, oh, he didn't sign yesterday. He's going back to Louisville. Well, we got to find another. I mean, receiver. it's possible. It's possible. Look, it's just it's hard, right? You can't make any visits. It's just communication. I will say that his quarterback, Pierce Clarkson, did sign with Louisville. So, yeah. you know, his, his, I think buddy, his brother's at Louisville as well. DeAndre Moore's brother. Yes, he is as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there there are there are some some opportunities for, for Louisville to win this thing back. Nothing is out of the realm of possibility. But again, I, I think Texas has done all it could on its end and that's probably is still the school that i would expect him to end up at that's good yeah we have to say the the brother being there and his quarterback being there is somewhat uh significant since tassili akana committed to texas in large part because his sister plays volleyball there right so yes. we have to that's on both matters. sides absolutely see that as significant texas picked up a big commitment from a corner in the transfer portal gavin holmes from wake forest and when you looked at the transfer class last year Ryan Watts may have been the like unsexiest name that they pulled in in the seven transfers. But when you look at it, just respective to his position, he might have been the best transfer that Texas brought in last year. You know, he came in, started opposite Deshaun Jameson and really stabilized that DB position on a, a defense that did a complete 180 from 2021. Based on what you know about Gavin Holmes, do you see him coming into the University of Texas, Texas and having that same type of impact that Ryan Watts did last year? Well, we know there's a lot of, of turnover in the secondary, right? Going into last year, we talked about the experience that Texas had back there. So naturally going into 23, you're like, okay, well, we might still be seeing how that dust is settling, but reinforcements are needed either way. So I think in that regard, bringing somebody with two years starting experience in the ACC, uh, especially where they throw it a bunch, is, is good news, right? Gavin Holmes is a guy who's been productive at Wake Forest, um, he, he's been able to work 
multiple cornerback positions. Uh, he, he gets his hands on the football. He's he's got all that experience to his name on top of it. So that can't hurt. And and that's the thing. We, we talk about it a lot at quarterback. When you bring in transfers, when you bring in high school players, all that stuff, you need to create competition, right? So when you bring them in through the portal and they've got that experience, there is an expectation that they're going to have an opportunity to play right away. Uh, so I think it kind of it lights a fire on both sides of the equation. He wants to come in and make a strong impression. And then the other guys are like, well, well, we want that spot too. So I think it creates a really nice situation for every school, but Texas included, because um, you can't have enough DBs. It's like pass rushers. We talked about that all last year. You can't have enough pass rushers who can get after the passer and having an experienced corner uh, who's who's put on some good weight since he got in, into the collegiate game. In addition to that experience, I mean, you can't have – uh, enough of that on your roster, especially with the turnover Texas is dealing with. So I I'm all for it. It was a big deal, big get. He was one of the – the corner is one of these positions where there's not a lot of experienced players. It's not like quarterback where there's 25 guys who you know can can at least, you know, uh, manage an offense. Corner, from a starting or experienced perspective, it feels like there's less than 10 in this class to date. That, that are floating around there in the portal. So to grab one of them is a really big deal for Texas. Yeah, Texas rotated a lot of DBs last year for various reasons. So you have to expect somebody with two years of starting experience and Gavin Holmes will be able to make an impact on this defense next year. A quick word from the Longhorn Real Estate team. And they're going to ask John about the impact this 2022 and 23 Texas class will have in the future. Dwell in Austin and Hill Country Mortgages have combined to make your Longhorn Real Estate team. For all your real estate needs, please visit www.longhornrealestateteam.com. In a changing, more complex market, you need to work with the top professionals in Austin. Our data and information-driven approach gives our clients a significant advantage. Decades of experience in all market conditions make us able to achieve the best results for our clients. And our clients for years have outperformed the market, leveraging our proprietary research, information, and expertise which is now more important than ever. Dwell in Austin. Hill Country Mortgages have combined to make your Longhorn Real Estate team. For your real estate needs in the Austin area, please visit www.longhornrealestateteam.com. Hill Country Mortgages, LLC, NMLS 2324262. Jonathan Sarver, NMLS 993872, equal housing opportunity. So, John, I had did a little research. I guess this was like over the summer, but this is something that always has stuck in my head because when you look at the 2021 Georgia national championship team, a lot of the foundational pieces from that recruiting class or on that team were from the 2018 and 2019 recruiting classes. When you looked at, you know, Jordan Davis, uh, what was the linebacker's name that went to the Eagles? Nicole Dean, yeah. um, James Cook, uh, Zamir White, the running backs, just so many uh, George Pickens, right? Like so many players from those classes ended up having huge impacts on that championship team. This may be a this may be the Texas Kool Aid in me, right? This may be the burnt orange Kool Aid. <laughs> Do you see the 2022 and 2023 classes for Texas having that type of impact? I'm not going to say they're going to win a national championship, but do you see the 2022 and 2023 classes for Texas being the classes that put them back at the top of college football? Well, they got to be, right? I mean, I think that's where we're at at this point. It, it's got to be these two classes together. And, and I think that's a great point that you bring up in general because we – we get so lost on focusing on one recruiting class and one victory or whatever it is, but it's really about stacking classes, right? So we talked about it earlier, five great O linemen last year, five more this year. That's an overhaul. That's how you overhaul a position. Same thing happened at edge uh, with, with Texas over the last couple of classes and, and in the secondary. So that's how you replenish and refuel uh, in, in very short order. So I, I, I do think, you still have to build it through traditional high school recruiting. Um, and, and you've got to do that with, with stacked classes back to back. So I do think the foundation is nice here because where we are curious about the 23 cycle, um, you know, up front on the D line, 2022 hit it, uh, you know, more successfully in my opinion. So now you balance that out just a, a little bit more. The receivers in this 23 class, a little bit smaller, a little bit faster. The 2022 receivers a little bit taller a little bit more polished in that regard. So I think you balance them out really, really nicely uh, overall, uh, and you create depth thereafter. So, look, the trench classes are really nice over these last two cycles. Uh, obviously, um, skill-wise, I mean, there's there's few programs that, that have hit it better than Texas 
in these few years as well. So, yeah, I think this is the type of foundation you've got to have moving forward. You still have to build national title teams through signing day, through the high school ranks. The portal has to be the supplement until until proven otherwise, right? We haven't seen a team that has gone so portal crazy make it, make it to the title game and win it, right? You know, you look at Georgia the last couple of years, you look at Alabama before that, LSU had a notable transfer in Joe Burrow, but uh, the rest of those guys were Louisianans. They were they were high school developed. So there really hasn't been that national title team, not not you know just quarterback, a team that has been built through the portal uh, as much as Ole Miss and Michigan State and some of these other schools would, would like to think that something like that's possible. So until that formula changes, stacking classes back to back is, is going to be the way to do it. So, yeah, I'd be curious to see. So I guess what you're saying is the 22 and 23 Texas class is going to give you the 24 or five national titles. Is that what you're projecting here? No, because it's hard to win a national championship, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm just comparing it. to the, That's the best comparison I can think of. I just think that this 2022 and 2023 class will be the classes at Texas that put Texas back into one of the top programs in the country perennially, right? Like every year they're going to be one of the top four to five teams in that Georgia. I, this is the, I, I could put it a better way. The 2022 and 2023 class will put Texas into that Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio State tier, and maybe even Michigan tier right now. In very possible three years, very possible. Look, I mean, you're recruiting better than Michigan did to to build its foundation. Um, obviously, you know, circumstance, style, so different up there. But talent wise, you're you're already ahead of of Jim Harbaugh's best classes at Michigan. So I think that is encouraging for Texas to to deal with. But now you got to go win, right? Um, in, in a much tougher road to to the conference title once you move to the SEC. However, they sort it out. It's not going to be easy, right? You know, you think of those those programs that are powers in that conference. There's not a lot of reason to believe they're going anywhere, right? Georgia certainly doesn't look like they're budging any time in the next decade. We know Alabama, every time we think they're going to go the other way, they grab the number one recruiting class like they did yesterday. Um, LSU looks revamped. A&M talent-wise is, is still going to be there. Uh, you know, Kentucky's been stable. Tennessee is on the rise. Florida's going to figure the thing out under Billy Napier. Oklahoma won't be as bad as they were this year, right? So, I mean, just think of your interconference rivals or soon to be rivals, and that road will never be easy. So, talent and depth, and that last part in particular, depth is, is the way you're going to have to climb because they're adding more games to the schedule, more teams to conferences, all that stuff. So, however it shakes out, you're going to have to win the marathon on top of being the the most flashy or, or notable team from a talent perspective. So in that regard, I do think Texas is doing it because you brought in almost 30 guys last year. And then this class that, that you signed this week is at 22 and growing. So you're talking about 50 plus high schoolers that are going to be able to come in and truly overhaul that roster. You supplement that with the transfer portal and some February guys. And all of a sudden you've got an entirely new roster in, in 18 to 24 months. That's the formula, especially once once you make a coaching change. And that's really how we should start to judge Sarkeesian beyond the on-field stuff. And a Manning at quarterback. And, and what John Garcia failed to mention is that all of those teams he mentioned in the SEC, they got to play Texas too, right? They got to lock up against 100%, Texas. 100%. And, Ask and, Alabama, right? I mean, they, and, they go and both play, ways. And play Texas too. Good times ahead for Texas with this 2022 and 2023 recruiting classes. Sark and company knocked it out the park. Longhorn Nation, hope you enjoyed a great early signing day. Hook them in peace. All right, brother. I got you out of here with only